Ready, Scott? Good morning, everyone. Scott gave me the thumbs up, and he's the one who runs the show. Come on in and find a seat. You stand in front of it. We'll sing our first song. Because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Because he lives, every fear is gone. He, I know he holds my life, my future in his hand. reminder today is sharing Sunday um, so uh, after announcements we will release the small children four and under or under five however we want to phrase it um, they can go downstairs and then oh up here and then after when we do our next song I think we bring it back in here I think it's time to go you're gonna keep the Alder I guess is the only oh Benji's here Benji and Alder yeah the two and unders for okay don't don't release the children yet. What do I know? Okay, thanks, Matt. Okay. So that I'm confused now, so <laughs> I hope they figured it out. Okay. <laughs> um OCBC directory is being updated, in case you haven't heard. Uh if your contact information has changed, address, email, phone number, what have you. Um, go ahead and let Camia Smith know that so that she can put that in. Um, and then the, is it the third weekend, Tori, in July? Third weekend in July, the Cullens are coming um, to visit with us. And we're going to have kind of a special uh, potluck to 
to show love to them. So um, yeah, keep that on your calendars. I think there's a uh, possibility that uh, Nikki Cacho might actually visit with us uh, sim a similar time around then too. But we're gonna just, we haven't seen the colons in a while, so we're gonna have a meal for them. And so keep that in, in mind as you make your summer plans. And then the only other announcement that I'm aware of is that we have a potluck today. It's going to be barbecue outside. Hopefully brought some side dishes and didn't bring a lot of desserts. Um, oh, and then we, did you want to do that? Oh, that's right. Okay. And so then we are going to, the other thing I'm aware of is if Shane and Dasha, could you guys come on up here for a minute? You guys got your speeches ready, right? <laughs> So, uh, Shane, and you come on up, it's fine, it's not gonna, I'm wearing shoes too, so, <laughs> just kidding. Uh, so, these folks are graduating, and if, yeah, they come through our body, and we just want to honor them and the hard work that they've accomplished, and so maybe I was going to ask you guys briefly to tell me kind of what, in like a sentence or two, what your like next steps are looking like, so we can pray for you guys, and then, um, yeah, we have a little th something for you, and then, yeah, we'll pray for you. Is that okay? Okay. Sure, we're not charging by the word, so. <laughs> All right, so my plan as of now is just in fall to start at Clackamas Community College. I don't have a super direct path that I'm going down yet, and so I'm hoping that in this next year, maybe um, the Lord will reveal more things to me or maybe a direction he wants me to go. I definitely have a few options I've been considering, but I'm just still praying about it. And so my goal is just to start on a lot of the basic classes and prerequisites that I'll need to take anyways um, before I can move on. And I'm going to start doing that this fall at Clackamas Community College. Thanks, sister. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> uh, thank you, everyone, for wanting to celebrate this time with us. Uh, my plans are to continue to follow God's uh, will for my life. And in praying about that, uh, I'm going to be starting, hopefully, around uh, end of summer, a career in welding. Uh, so hopefully that goes well. I'm taking some certification classes uh, right now. I've got my certification test this Monday, so hopefully that goes well. So, thank you. Monday, you said? Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> so maybe a, a couple of the elders come on up, and we're going to pray for these guys. And uh, Yeah. Dear Lord, we just thank you for um, these uh, two individuals, for Shane and Dasha. We just thank you for their uh, commitment towards you, Lord. And uh, it's just been such a blessing and honor for me personally just to see them uh, growing up at such a young age and, and maturing into adulthood uh, and maturing in, in wisdom and in faith in you, Lord. And I just ask that you continue to bless them in their journey as they continue to walk uh, with you, Lord. Hey, Father, it's always kind of a shock to see our children grow up and uh, mature into adults, but we thank you so much for the blessing that these two have been, and we pray that you would guide them as they continue maturing in you and growing in the body that you lead them to. Our Father, we thank you for these young people that have come through this church and come through Sunday school and part of the mission outreach. We thank you for their choice to follow you, Lord, and we ask you, Lord, in the future, as they grow to adulthood and for careers and families, Lord, that they still keep you strong in their heart and walk your ways. We again thank you for the gift you've given this church for them. We just ask you to bless them. Lord, thank you so much for your faithfulness that you raise generation after generation of people who love you and want to follow after you. Every both Shane and Dasha, that you would make um, Make their faith their own, uh, that you would reveal to both of them the paths that you, that you have for them, the good works you have for them in their lives, and that your spirit would bear much fruit in their lives. And, and uh, yeah, especially in the, in the next coming week or two, or weeks or two, that you would, you would, you would give them wisdom um, to know where they ought to walk and decisions that they make that can sometimes pave the path for their future. 
We love you, Lord, and we're thankful for you as our Father as we, as we prepare ourselves to be in your kingdom forever. We pray that you would encourage us and help us to be supportive as a body to these folks. Good morning. Quite a few of you had me worried this morning. I, I didn't show up that early and the parking lot was empty. I thought, uh-oh, everybody's on vacation. But you all showed up, so. Well, this morning we're going to be looking at chapter 2 of Daniel. And we're going to break it up a little different instead of reading the passage because it's an entire t- chapter. I'll just read it as we go along. Um, and I've broken it down into three parts, so hopefully... It, uh, we can make it through most of it and not skip over too much. Let's pray and then we can get right into it. Dear Father, again we thank you that we can gather together and open your word. We just ask that it would be clear and that we would um, understand the things that you desire for us to work on or to change or to learn about you. I just ask for your blessing this morning in your name. Amen. Uh, thank you, Jim, for opening uh, last week with a little overview of the book and of covering chapter one. And this morning, as we work through chapter two, we'll look at kind of three sections so we can break it down into three points. The first will be, we'll look at the wisdom of Babylon. We'll notice that the wisdom of Babylon is powerless. And it can kind of be related to the wisdom of the world, which is in itself powerless also. Then we're going to look at uh, how contrary to the wisdom of Babylon, the wisdom of God is full of power. The wisdom of God is full of power. And finally, we'll see third, that uh, through the dreams of the king and the interpretation, that God will reveal the future power of his kingdom, and we'll see that the kingdom of God is powerful as well. So if you open to chapter 2, or I believe you can follow along on the screen, we'll start with chapter 2. In the second year of his reign, Nebuchadnezzar had dreams. His mind was troubled, and he could not sleep. So the king summoned the magicians, enchanters, sorcerers, and astrologers to tell him what he had dreamed. When they came in and stood before the king, he said to them, I've had a dream that troubles me, and I want to know what it means. The astrologers answered the king, May the king live forever. Tell your servants the dream, and we will interpret it. The king replied to the astrologers, This is what I have firmly decided. If you do not tell me what my dream was and interpret it, I will have you cut into pieces and your houses turned into piles of rubble. But if you tell me the dream and explain it, you will receive gifts from me and rewards and great honor. So tell me the dream and interpret it for me. Once more they replied, let the king tell his servants the dream and we will interpret it. Then the king answered, I'm certain that you are trying to gain time because you realize that this is what I have firmly decided. If you do not tell me the dream, there is only one penalty for you. You have conspired to tell me misleading and wicked things, hoping the situation will change. So then, tell me the dream, and I will know that then you can interpret it for me. The astrologers astrologers answered the king, There is no one on earth who can do what the king asks. No king, however great and mighty, has ever asked such a thing of any magician or enchanter or astrologer. What the king asks is too difficult. No one can reveal it to the king except the gods, and they do not live among the humans. This made the king so angry and furious that he ordered the execution of all the wise men of Babylon. So the decree was issued to put the wise men to death, and men were sent to look for Daniel and his friends to put them to death. I've always appreciated the book of Daniel. It reads like a story. It's a narrative. So a lot of times some of the Old Testament books like Leviticus or Numbers It's easy for when you're reading them for your mind to begin to wander, but I feel like Daniel is something that we can read and really absorb and pay attention to easily. So right away what we see is that this takes place in the second year of uh, the reign of the king of Babylon, which is King Nebuchadnezzar. And in working through the timeline, this is probably in reality his fourth year of reign uh, in, in that city. Two of those years were basically spent in conjunction with his father, who had become old and probably sick, so King Nebuchadnezzar was helping him reign along that time, and then that sets the right time frame for Daniel and his friends to be in the employment of the king, as they had been trained for a number of years before they they were able to serve the king. 
A little backstory on Babylon might help us understand where this idea of the wisdom of Babylon comes from. As Nebuchadnezzar reigned with his father, uh, who was old and probably sick, he gathered or maybe he was given part of this massive army that Babylon had and he kind of went on a conquering spree. So a couple, he defeated uh, the Egyptians at Karakamish on the Euphrates and then he drove out a man named Nico who was a ruler in Asia. And then as he was victorious in these battles, he went directly to Jerusalem, and we read there that Jehoiakim surrendered to him, and then the 70 years of uh, the captivity for Israel began. So from that point of view, uh, from looking at it like a world power type of view, the king would appear to have a lot going for him. He was conquering other empires. At the same time, he was expanding the boundaries of his own empire. He kind of went where he wanted, he took what he wanted, he destroyed what he wanted. So in his mind, he was very powerful. In his eyes, probably in the eyes of the world, as they maybe looked out and saw this, this massive army coming, they perceived him as being very powerful. And the kingdom of Babylon had immense wealth and power and resources in the world at that time. And then we see that one night, Nebuchadnezzar went to bed, as all good rulers do, and he fell asleep. He had a very disturbing dream. In fact, it was so disturbing that it woke him up and then he could not rest. He could not uh, ease his mind. His conscience was bothering him. <clears throat> the fact that he was inconsolable, that he was restless and not at ease, set the stage for then what followed. Now, I imagine at this point, the king would not be satisfied with any answer. He couldn't just be told, oh, forget about it. It's no big deal. People, they have dreams all the time. You just had a dream like everybody does. In fact, maybe it was that big meal, uh, that big fatty lamb meal and hummus that you had. It just upset your stomach and you had a dream. No, this is the king of Babylon and he takes what he wants. He destroys what he wants. He conquers where he desires. And he desired to have an answer that satisfied his curiosity. And we know that the king, as we read in chapter one, had taken not only probably from his land, from among his people, but also from those that he conquered. He took many of the very best and brightest, maybe the youngest boys to raise them up as his own personal army of advisors. He could kind of train them and get them manipulated into the type of people that would serve him and do his will. So we saw that he had them trained up, he fed them, he gave them wine, he trained them with the language and the culture, the history, so that they could bring this worldly wisdom and knowledge to bear whenever he desired it. So basically, he had the wisest counsel that was available anywhere. Naturally, as the king, he decided to call upon this human wisdom to interpret his dream, to tell him not only the dream, but what it meant. And I notice that he does admit the dream troubled him. Something about this specific dream uh, caused him enough discomfort that he couldn't even sleep. It wasn't his common dream where he could just move on about his day. This one really bothered him. He could not let it go, perhaps because it was not just a random dream that his conscience was plagued by it. We see in uh, other portions of the Old Testament that other people have received dreams from God. There's quite a few in Genesis. We have Jacob, Joseph, uh, if you remember Pharaoh's cupbearer and his baker. Pharaoh had dreams, Solomon, and then in Matthew, Joseph had a dream. So God had definitely used dreams to convey prophecy throughout history. Well, since King Nebuchadnezzar was all powerful, he believed that he could just summon others and they would tell him the answers. He could just ask them to do what he wanted and they would miraculously come up with, with these things to tell him. But little does he know that this dream is from God and only the one that God chooses to reveal it through could give him the answer that he demanded. As we work through this, we see, I think, a little bit of the pride of those who the king called upon. They don't feel like they were just mainly servants. I think they probably felt they were a little better than everybody else. And they came before him and they boasted, all right, tell us this dream and we'll give you the meaning. Now to me, that was kind of an empty boast. <laughs> Since the king's asking, it might mean that he had no idea of his own. So I bet all those magicians and enchanters, those sorcerers, hope they could just go into private discussions talk amongst themselves, maybe take a vote, and then tell the king what they thought he would want to hear. He would be bound to believe them since they are the wise ones. He's asking them for help. So obviously if he's asking them for help, they are the ones who can give him the answer. I think we, might, we could appreciate the king's response. He responded to them with basically an emphatic no. 
He's not going to give them any details. He's not going to help them at all. I thought, was he doubting their ability to actually do this? Was he wanting to test them and see if all this work that he'd put into them uh, was actually going to bear fruit? Or did he really just forget the dream and only remember some small details that were disturbing him? I don't know. Most of you probably dream dreams every once in a while. Like I said, if you eat a bad meal, you'll have a dream. You wake up from that dream. You kind of remember something bothered you, but you can't put it all together because the dream just is, they're chaotic, they aren't organized, and they kind of just slip away as you, as you wake up and go about your day. You kind of think, was I really dreaming or was it just a fog? Or maybe he was just a cruel king and he wanted to bend others to his way or destroy them. If you don't do what I say, I will just destroy you. Well, the most likely reason for this response that we can tell from the explanation of this passage is that the king did not remember the details. That is, he could kind of recall the substance, kind of like when you wake up and you know you had a dream, but you're not quite sure what it was. Perhaps some small memory or a tiny recognition of it was still left in his mind. And that way, if the wise man could tell him what it was, his mind would fully remember and his soul would then be at rest. That he uh, knew they weren't lying to him, that they knew the dream, um, it would be familiar, and then he'd, he'd get the answer that he really wanted. And we see the enchanters kind of try to go along uh, with him. They try and reason with the king. They try and convince him, just tell us a little bit, and then we'll give you the answer. They tried to use logic and rational argument against him. But the more that they talk, it seems like the more the king just becomes stubborn and unchangeable. He's not going to let them tell him what to do. And I think his power is now going to his head. He's becoming demanding. Uh, he's insisting that his servants perform the impossible. And I believe that now they're, they're terrified. I mean, he just threatened to kill all of them. So how in the world are they going to do this? To what possible man-made god or idol are they going to run to? Now they can't rely on themselves, so it probably comes to mind, what are we going to do? Where are we going to turn? This type of a request has never been made before, and they probably had never heard of it being made anywhere else. So all the great training that they had now is worthless. And we begin to see in this story the powerlessness of the wisdom of Babylon. Notice that the wise men even said, this is, what, this is something you would ask the gods. You wouldn't ask something of this of humans. And then they also admit the gods don't dwell or live with humans. How are they supposed to even talk to them or approach them? And in that aspect, they were correct. Their man-made gods did not even live. They weren't alive. They were wood or stone or precious metal. I mean, now that they have a real problem, they look over and they see this little idol just sitting there. It, it, now they really picture how worthless it is. It's powerless to help them in their time of need. And I love how they're basically uh, exposing their worthlessness before the king. They could invent interpretations of the dream, but they could never tell Nebuchadnezzar precisely what he had dreamed. Right then, it looked as if they were all just going to be brutally murdered in the king's fury. However, as we're going to see, the God of Israel, the God of Daniel, our God, lives among men. He has made himself known both through creation and through scripture so that we can be assured he is in control. A quick ap application at this point, I think, is pretty easy and precise. We should seek God's wisdom, not man's wisdom. Man's wisdom, or wisdom that people find from uh, the world that is full of sinners, is powerless. I looked up uh, Merriam's dictionary definition of uh, powerless, and it says that it means devoid of strength or resources. These magicians and wise men were now at a point where they had no strengths or resources. It also says that it's lacking in authority or capacity to act, and all of those fits nicely on where these men find themselves at. Nothing in all the kingdom that they were aware of could help them. They didn't have authority or, or capacity to carry out the request of the king. They couldn't act upon what he was demanding. They were, they were literally at a dead end. And I think today we, we face many similar temptations, especially since this year is an election year. Now, it's all well and good if you want to be involved with politics of our nation if you want to be involved with the, the rules and how things go. But it's proper, I think, as well to pray for our leaders, to desire that they lead well. But it's not where we place our hope. Our world is not where we place our hope. This world is heading for destruction, and the kingdom that we long for is the eternal kingdom of God. 
All of this around us is temporary, and it will pass. As we're seeing here, we're seeing a nation of Babylon who is being confronted with the fact that they will not remain in control forever. And that's something that we need to remember today is that everything is temporary except for the kingdom of God. Let's continue with the passage. And we'll pick up in chapter, er, verse 14. When Arioch, the commander of the king's guard, had gone out to put to death the wise men of Babylon, Daniel spoke to him with wisdom and tact. He asked the king's officer, why did the king issue such a harsh decree? Arioch then explained the matter to Daniel. At this, Daniel went into the king and asked for time so that he might interpret the dream for him. Then Daniel returned to his house and explained the matter to his friends, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. He urged them to plead for mercy from God, from the God of heaven concerning this mystery, so that he and his friends might not be executed with the rest of the wise men of Babylon. During the night, the mystery was revealed to Daniel in a vision. Then Daniel praised the God of heaven and said, Praise be to the name of God forever and ever. Wisdom and power are his. He changes the time and the seasons. He disposes of kings and raises up others. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to the discerning. He reveals deep and hidden things. He knows what lies in darkness and light dwells with him. I thank and praise you, God of my ancestors. You have given me wisdom and power. You have made known to me what we asked of you. You have made known to us the dream of the king. Then Daniel went to Arioch, whom the king had appointed to execute the wise men of Babylon, and said to him, do not execute the wise men of Babylon. Take me to the king, and I will interpret the dream for him. Arioch took Daniel to the king at once and said, I have found a man among the exiles from Judah who can tell the king what his dream means. The king asked Daniel, also called Belshazzar, Are you able to tell me what I saw in my dream and interp interpret it? And Daniel replied, No wise man, enchanter, magician, or diviner can explain to the king the mystery he asked about. But there is a God in heaven who reveals mysteries. He has shown King Nebuchadnezzar what will happen in days to come. Your dream and the visions that passed through your mind as you were lying in the bed are these. As your majesty was lying there, your mind turned to things to come, and the revealer of mysteries showed you what is going to happen. As for me, this mystery has been revealed to me, not because I have greater wisdom than anyone else alive, but so that your majesty may know the interpretation and that you may understand what went through your mind. So we get to the point where the, the death decree had gone out, and I think once the king makes a decree, it's pretty hard to undo it, so people are terrified. It's about to be put into action. Daniel heard about it, and naturally, he asked Arioch to explain what's going on. Now, Daniel, thankfully, had a resource that all the other wise men did not have. He had the god of his fathers. And again, thankfully, God, who is unlike the gods of Babylon, deals directly with his creation. Daniel then risked his life to approach the king and ask for time. And he also asked his friends to pray for him. And I think that probably took courage because, again, I don't think you could just go to the king any time you wished. And we begin to see this example of a godly man that God has formed. Daniel goes now directly to God with his problem. The problem is, I don't think knowing the dream and its interpretation of the dream, the problem is that Daniel and his friends are going to be killed along with these other wise men, these uh, sorcerers of Babylon. And Daniel obviously doesn't want that. So God answers Daniel's prayer and reveals the dream and interpretation to him. Notice again now, after he went to God first for help, that now he does the next natural thing and he gives the praise to God. Back in verse 19, during the night, the mystery was revealed to Daniel in a vision. Then Daniel praised the God of heaven. So immediately, he turns back to God for who all good things come from. Daniel's reaction is opposite of the king. Daniel does not seek the counsel of others. He does not resort to man-made idols. He does not call upon this fate and chance that probably the other people had been taught. Daniel goes directly to God. And when God answers him, he praises him. Unlike the king, Daniel knows that the rulers and nations are raised up and brought down by God's will and God's will alone. The power of God is sure and never failing. These things aren't just random chances that we need to be worried, oh, who's in power or who's not in power. Everything about Daniel and the king as we read through this are, is being made apparent as being opposites. We saw that the king is reactionary. He demands results or he gives out destruction. He's agitated, he's worked up. 
sleeps evading him, and his spirit is not at rest. On the other hand, Daniel, as we read, we see he's secure in God. He's calm, he moves with determination and intent. He's even able to sleep while the king can't sleep because he trusts in God. So I hope just in reading these two accounts that we can see there's a big difference between those who trust in man and his wisdom and those who trust in God and his wisdom. And I think as I was reading, I kind of saw a shift in momentum in this part of the narrative so far. In chapter one and the first part of two, things have just been kind of flying along. We see that Daniel and his friends are taken captive. Their lives are kind of twisted upside down. They're ripped out of what they know and shoved into a foreign uh, culture and country. They spend a couple years in training. Uh, They're probably under a magnifying glass. Everything that they do is being observed to make sure that they're obeying what the king says. So they're constantly watched and monitored. The king is busy. He's going here and there. He's conquering. He's uh, destroying. He, He becomes agitated. He can't rest. Decrees begin flying out the door, and people are cowering in fear. And then the narrative just kind of slows down, almost goes to a halt. And Daniel shifts the focus from the king and his kingdom to God. In this moment of deceleration, God will demonstrate the difference between hollow religions of convenience that do not change people's conducts or hearts to a faith in him that creates new hearts turned towards doing the will of God. Daniel focuses on praising God for his character. He takes the time to first give God the credit for all the wisdom and power that he's been given. He mentions that God has always existed and always will. He has no beginning and no end. All of wisdom and power belongs to the Lord. There is nothing that humans can claim as their own as coming from themselves. God gives freely to each as he desires and withholds as his infinite wisdom decrees. I remember reading through some of the uh, descriptions of how the Israelites were commanded to build the temple and the tabernacle and all the garments and the the curtains. And then at the end of each one, it says, God will provide the craftsmen who know how to do this. I was always thinking, how do these people uh, come up with the way that God wants it done? And then we see that God even provides the craftsmen with their skill to do his will. So we look out at the world, consumed by who is coming and who is going. And I think at times we are. But Daniel says that even the seasons, not just the rulers and the nations, but even the seasons are changed by God and God alone. So the fact that it goes from summer to winter, fall, winter, spring, that's all because God is controlling everything. God lifts rulers up and he takes them down. And I think that specifically should be of great comfort to us today. Regardless of who will be our leader or what laws they will will enact, our joy is with God and in him alone. He alone sits on the throne of the universe, and at his name all will bow at his feet. Paul says in Romans 16.25, Now to him who is able to establish you in accordance with my gospel, the message I proclaim about Jesus Christ, in keeping with the revelation of the mystery hidden for long ages past, but now revealed and made known through the prophetic writings by the command of the eternal God, so that all the Gentiles might come to the obedience that comes from faith. To the only wise God be glory forever through Jesus Christ. Amen. God is the only wise God. The the gods of Babylon, the gods of today, nothing, worthless. God is the only wise God. And everything that he does is always in, in consistency with his will, working out his Uh, perfect end. Just as Daniel trusted in God, we can trust that the events unfolding around us today are in alignment with the will of God. There is no reason to fear or to fret. We need to remember, as mentioned many times in scripture, do not be afraid. God is in control of everything. The wisdom of God is powerful. Daniel also reveals that God is the God who gives his servants wisdom and knowledge. All through scripture, we can read that wisdom and knowledge are desirable and that they come from God and God alone. He's unlike all those false gods who are inanimate and helpless. God has spoken through the prophets through redemptive history and he speaks to us today through the Bible. We know that God is a God of covenants and they're very special covenants. We read about them throughout the Bible and God uh, keeps his covenants. He works them out to his complete will with his people. How vastly different is that from these inanimate gods who literally do nothing? We have a God who is a God of covenants, who has a plan for our lives. 
to bring glory and honor to him. I find it interesting, uh, it does exemplify Daniel's commitment to God that he's not bought off by the beauty and the allure of Babylon. I'm sure it was a pretty impressive n- nation. There was, the cities were probably uh, full of everything man could want. He also wasn't caught up in the terror of the king's edict. He didn't go panic and hide or try and figure out who he could make do his will. He went directly to God. And he's not complacent. He's not lulled by the lavishness of the empire. He, he's not bought off by all the food and the drink and the, uh, the teaching and the, the relaxation that he got to experience. Daniel is focused and content in the God of his fathers. Even in a foreign land, isolated in a strange kingdom, ruled by uh, people he doesn't recognize, he remains committed and focused to God. Likewise, I think that we need to elevate our understanding of God to be in line with what he reveals to us in Scripture. Well, now we can move on to the vision, uh, to the interpretation of the dream. And a lot of people don't really like uh, prophecy and end time stuff. We're not really going to get into it yet, but we're going to look at a couple things here. Um, Through this revealing of the dream, we're going to see the third point, that the kingdom of God is full of power, real effectual power. And this is the kingdom that we are to look forward to in anticipation. Uh, We'll pick up in verse 31. Your majesty looked, and there before you stood a large statue, an enormous dazzling statue, awesome in appearance. The head of the statue was made of pure gold, its chest and arms of silver, its belly and thighs of bronze, its legs of iron, its feet partly of iron and partly of baked clay. While you were watching, a rock was cut out, but not by human hands. It struck the statue on its feet of iron and clay and smashed them. Then the iron, the clay, the bronze, the silver, and the gold were all broken to pieces and became like chaff on the threshing floor in the summer. The wind swept them away without leaving a trace. But the rock that struck the statue became a huge mountain and filled the whole earth. This was the dream, and now we will interpret it to the king. Your majesty, you are the king of the kings. The God of heaven has given you dominion and power and might and glory. In your hands he has placed all mankind and the beasts of the field and the birds in the sky. Wherever they live, he has made you ruler over them all. You are the head of gold. After you, another kingdom will arise inferior to yours. Next, a third kingdom, one of bronze, will rule over the whole earth. Finally, there will be a fourth kingdom, strong as iron, for iron breaks and smashes everything. And as iron breaks things to pieces, so it will crush and break all others. Just as you saw that the feet and toes were partly of baked clay and partly of iron, so this will be a divided kingdom. Yet it will have some of the strength of iron in it, even as you saw iron mixed with clay. As the toes were partly iron and partly clay, so this kingdom will be partly strong and partly brittle. And just as you saw the iron mixed with baked clay, so the people will be a mixture and will not remain united any more than iron mixes with clay. In the time of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that will never be destroyed, nor will it be left to another people. It will crush all those kingdoms and bring them to an end, but it will itself endure forever. This is the meaning of the vision of the rock cut out of the mountain, but not by human hands. A rock that broke the iron, the bronze, the clay, the silver, and the gold to pieces. The great God has shown the king what will take place in the future. The dream is true, and its interpretation is trustworthy. Then King Nebuchadnezzar fell prostrate before Daniel and paid him honor in order that an offering of incense be presented to him. The king said to Daniel, Surely your God is the God of gods and the Lord of kings and a revealer of mysteries, for you were able to reveal this mystery. Finally, we got to the actual content of the dream, all this build up, you know, what was he dreaming? Can they figure out what it is? And now we see. Appreciate with me, however, that before Daniel just jumps into the dream and its interpretation, he once again gives glory to God. And this time he does it before the king. Daniel has worshiped God, the God who gives, both in private and now in public. He seeks God first, and he gives God the praise and credit before he does anything else. Well, uh, what does the dream, what is the dream and what does it mean? And I think the best explanation for some of the questions that might arise from this text is as follows. And I should have a slide up here that charts the kingdom progressions. Obviously, as we read, the head of gold represents the kingdom of Babylon. And Daniel Daniel specifically names Nebuchadnezzar as that head of gold. According to Daniel, revealed to the king, yes, the king had been made very powerful by God. There was no doubt that he was the most powerful ruler of the world at that time. 
And the first part of that dream is that he will eventually fall. After Babylon fell, which it was bound to do, we see in the history of Judah that then the Medo-Persian Empire came to be. They are the silver chest and two arms. King Cyrus, he ruled uh, Persia during that time, and under his rule, the people of Judah were released and allowed to journey back to the Promised Land. Then the Medo-Persian Empire was uh, faded from the picture, and the great rule of Greece was raised up. They're re represented by the belly and the thighs of bronze. Another well-known ruler uh, named Alexander the Great was their leader. And after Greece, there was the well-known Roman Empire, and it came and occupied the land and held the seat of power for a time. And they were represented by the, iron, the legs of iron. And again, God's people were then brought under its rule and control, and we're familiar with uh, that whole situation in the New Testament. So this short timeline of Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, and Rome seems to fit the four kingdoms that are described by Daniel in the interpretation of the dream. Now, regardless of who the kingdoms were, regardless of how powerful they were in comparison with one another, or the length of time that they occupied, or even maybe what they contributed to the world and uh, different cultures, what I think we need to see is that none of them are there at the end. The point of the dream is not to emphasize one empire over another, not to say this one's better than that one, these people were more privileged. Uh, the world leaders, as we see even today, are still subject to God whether they want to admit it or not. Their beliefs do not dictate what God will carry out. We see that at the end there is a rock that is cut out and it's thrown at the feet of the, the big statue, breaking everything to pieces, and finally even the wind disperses and blows away the tiniest particles that are left. And this, rep this rock represents the kingdom of God, which would be ruled eternally by the Messiah, the King of Kings. That kingdom that God set up will last forever. Everything else is temporary, uh, nothing that we can put our faith and hope in, but this kingdom of God is forever. It's his kingdom alone. He is the ruler, he's the judge, and he's the Lord. It will endure and last forever. And that is the focus of this dream. Uh, Luke 20, 17, speaking of Jesus, says, But he looked directly at them and said, What then is this that is written? The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. Everyone who falls on that stone will be broken to pieces, and when it falls on anyone, it will crush him. And that speaks of the life of Christ really well. He, he is that stone that was rejected. He appeared powerless while on this earth. He was scorned and rejected by men. Uh, he was beaten and bruised and crucified. And as you, so you see that, you think, how could he possibly be the almighty, powerful God? Yet we see that he is raised from the dead and seated at the right hand of God. He is powerful. He has victory over death. He is impressive. He is on the throne of the universe, and he's honored at the right hand of God. We're told in Philippians 2, 9 through 11, Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of the Father. Daniel's seen this fullness of the kingdom of God revealed to him by God. This is the kingdom that God will set up. 600 years after Daniel goes before the king with this interpretation, Jesus Christ comes to earth, and that kingdom of God that Daniel is pointing towards is set in firm foundation. The dream ultimately revealed that Daniel's God, the only God, is the power behind all earthly kingdoms, and his kingdom will eventually be set up and never overthrown. Well, we've made it through uh, chapter 2 there, so let's get to some quick application. First of all, as I mentioned before, we can pray for wisdom. Now, the wisdom that Daniel received was revelatory, and it has ceased. We know that today we have the final closed authority of the Word of God in Scripture. He does not speak to us as he did in the Old Testament. We simply cannot believe those who falsely claim, God told me. If we want to know what God says, we need to go to Scripture and make sure that what we hear from others compares uh, correctly with what Scripture says. Through the written word is how God speaks to us now. We also do not have prophets as in the days past. You can rest assured that all of those people who claim to be prophets are false. And this seems to be very common, especially in the charismatic movement of today. These types of leaders are nothing more than self-serving false teachers and I suggest you watch out for them like the plague. However, the Bible is full of descriptions and prescriptions for wisdom. James 1 through 5, if you lack wisdom, 
Let him ask God who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to him. Don't chase the wisdom of humans. It's not really wisdom at all. It is self-serving and self-worshipping. It only seeks to usurp the rule of God over our life. What we need as believers, as Christians, is the wisdom that is given by the Spirit of God. We are like Daniel, exiles in a land, and we need wisdom to navigate the time that we live in. We have as many challenges before us as Daniel did, and we need wisdom just as he did to live righteously before God in a godless land. So pray for wisdom, as Daniel and his friends did. Second, remember that the kingdom of God is a present reality. Now this idea is a sermon or a sermon series by itself. We can't get into that in depth, but know that the kingdom prophesied about in this dream has already come, and that has happened through and in Jesus Christ. It is through repentance and faith in what Jesus has accomplished for us on the cross that we're brought into his kingdom. Even when we look at the world and wonder, what exactly is going on? When is Christ going to return? We can know that his kingdom is powerful and it is accomplishing his will even now. His kingdom is a present reality, but it is, kind of falls into this yet to come category. There's much that is not yet realized in the kingdom of God. There's this tension between the now and the yet to come. And it is in Jesus that we will see our coming king, the coming of the kingdom of God. And even now, while we do enjoy quite a few things of the kingdom, we are still waiting for the fulfillment of all that is God's kingdom in the future. In the New Testament accounts of Jesus, we see him refer to the kingdom of God as having come, meaning that because he is the king and he is among them, the kingdom was present. Luke 11:20, he said, But it is, if it is by the finger of God that I cast out demons, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. And Luke 17, 21, Behold, the kingdom of God is in the midst of you. What we as part of the church of God, uh, the bride of Christ, have yet to do is to continue to make that visible to the world. Sinners are blind to the kingdom of God, and we're to bear wit witness that it's a reality. That's why we need to bear fruit so that they see we are different. We are indeed made new in Christ. Our king has come, and to deny this is to miss one of the most significant aspects of the New Testament. We must declare the gospel so that others may believe and enter eternal life in the kingdom through Jesus Christ. And as to the part that is yet to come, the future aspect of the kingdom in its final consummation will occur when Christ will return for the church. He will destroy his enemies and make all things new. And third, and I think this is probably the most important, is to truly know who God is. Pay attention to what uh, Daniel said about God in chapter 2. He praises God for his power, his omnipotence, his providence, and his goodness. I think we should be constantly in the habit of not just asking how we apply such t and such a text to our lives, but what does it reveal to us about God as well? It's not a bad idea to review periodically and often the attributes of God. I think keeping them in mind will help us turn to him when we face trials and tribulations because each attribute of God can be applied to some time or of trial that we may face. Do we need to be provided for, taken care of, loved, reassured, protected, maybe made to be valuable? Whatever our needs may be, the necessary ones will be met in our God and in him alone. Well, as we break this time for a time of sharing and worship, uh, let the next few minutes be a time to reflect on your heart. Uh, I went yesterday just for a little while and helped out at the camp work day. And I've noticed this before, but sometimes when you go somewhere, you see, you see a building like camp or you see a property like camp, and you think it looks really good. But when you go and actually work, you realize what time has done to it, uh, what um, deteriorates, what gets old, what needs replacing. I mean, it's, it's actually more than you would ever notice just by walking in there. So I think it's important for us to take a look at our hearts regularly, even those who have been Christians for a while, just to make sure that we haven't become complacent and let the world kind of break us down and destroy parts of our character. So take a time to reflect. Make sure that your heart is right before God to partake communion together. And we're going to have a short time of sharing and worshiping. Just uh, use that time to really, um, to really remember what Christ has done for us. Humble yourselves before God. And then we'll share the table together, uh, rejoicing that Christ will return. And uh, then a time of eating and fellowship. 
Dear Father, we thank you again for your word. We thank you for all its complexities and, and the way that you use human words to convey your will and to convey yourself to us. I thank you that you have revealed to us and the future, that we can trust you without knowing the details. We can trust you like Daniel did, knowing that you are in control, that uh, no matter how bad things get, we do not need to be afraid or worry. And I think that as I th ask you that as a family uh, in Christ together, we would be able to encourage each other and build each other. In your name, amen. I like that, uh, David, examining the heart. Uh, there's a, I'm going to talk more about this song and the, the rest of the songs during sharing time, but there's a line in here that goes along really well with that. It um, says, my heart needs a surgeon and my soul needs a friend. And Elliot says, I, my heart found a surgeon, my soul found a friend. Jeremiah 17, the heart is deceitful above all things and beyond cure. Who can understand it? I, the Lord, search the heart and examine the mind to reward each person according to their conduct and according to what their deeds deserve. Um, I have been a believer since I was five years old. Um, I sometimes have a hard time having that context about what it means to have a, a, a heart that's deceitful above all things, but then I get little glimpses, reminders that um, I too am not immune from that. And then, of course, we look at the world around us and look at the effects of what a sinful heart does. Um, but the solution is not death, at least the intended solution. Um, a lot of places in the uh, Bible, all, all, I think three of the four Gospels make note of this passage. I picked the one in Mark. It says, And the scribes of the Pharisees, when they saw that he, Jesus, was eating with the sinners and tax collectors, and said to his disciples, Why does he eat with them? And when Jesus heard it, he said to them, Though Those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. I have come not to call the righteous, but sinners, sinners like you and me. Let's stand. See you. 